Um, I was talking to Bob, and uh, Bob was like, you know, in my presentation, I wanted to develop your seven points out of House Divided that shows that the millennium was fulfilled between, you know, roughly between AD, 60, uh, AD 27 to AD 67, but I just didn't have the time. And he said, you know, if you're going to do this subject, why don't you do that? And I said, you know, I was kind of planning on that, and that's a good idea, so that's kind of what I'm going to do. Um, and I'm going to synthesize uh, the rabbinical views on the resurrection, the millennium, the thousand years, the judgment, and the battle of Gog and Magog. And I'm going to show you how they parallel exactly with the same time frame and nature as John does in the book of Revelation. Then I'm going to synthesize reformed views, particularly amillennialism and postmillennial partial preterism. I'm going to leave out the the red-headed stepchild of premillennialism, because I don't really think it has much to offer. I would agree with the early creeds that see that that system is a carnalization of the kingdom of God. It, it just recapitulates carnal views of the kingdom that were held by some of the Jews. Uh, I, I believe postmillennial has, postmillennialism has aspects of that as well, but we're going to look at primarily those two views, and we're going to synthesize them. At the Criswell Conference a long time ago, for the first time, preterism, full preterism, or we can call pret-millennialism, was presented. Uh, in a conference, G.K. Beale was there to represent all millennialism. Um, Ken Gentry was there to present post-millennialism, and Don Preston was there to present our position. And I went, I flew out there because I thought this was a historical moment in time, I want to be there, and in case Don has a heart attack, you know, if they need someone, I'll be there, right? <laughs> and, I, you know, at the hotel, I was kind of scribbling down, I was like, well, Mike, what would you present if, if you were given this opportunity? And so I, I kind of scribbled down some five points and then seven points, they turned into articles, and then eventually came in the second edition of our book, House Divided. Uh, so I'm going to share those arguments with you, and I believe that they synthesize uh, the other views very well and show you that they are actually reformed. Let's review some of Bob's uh, lecture. Um, he shows how the outline in Revelation uh, demands that the, revelation, or that the millennium ended uh, by AD 70. They concern, Revelation 119 says, the entire prophecy concerns things in the past, things in the present, John was in the tribulation, and things that were about to come or about to be fulfilled. Nowhere in there does he say, except for Revelation, you know, you know, seven verses, 15 verses, you know, dealing with the millennium. That's nowhere in there. That has to be read into that. Um, the imminent time texts function as two bookends. Now, uh, Vern Poitras, uh, Simon Kistemacher, other Reformed people will say, they're all millennials, and they will say, hey, look, you preterists, partial preterists, if you're going to take the time text in Revelation as, fulfilling, as being fulfilled in AD 70, you have to take the whole thing. You can't just isolate one chapter, a few verses out of that chapter, and say that's future. Exegetically and logically, that just simply does not make sense. I would add a third point to Bob's excellent material, and that is where John is told, do not seal up the pro prophetic words of the prophecy, singular, of this book, singular, for the time is near. If Revelation 25 through 15 were referring to events thousands and tens of thousands, if not millions of years, if you're a post-millennialist, you think the millennium is going to last that long, possibly, don't you think God would tell John, Seal up, uh, there's another prophecy here, seal this one up, for the time is far off, thousands if not millions of years. But he doesn't do that. He did that with Daniel, he did that with John. Why doesn't he do it another time with John if that, those verses are separated from the imminent time frame of the book itself? Uh, let's look at uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and rabbinical beliefs. I want to show you. I want you to see Christ in a magnificent way, that Yeshua is the only candidate that can be the Messiah and the Savior of the nations, then and today, all right? Um, so according to the research of G.K. Beale and his commentary on Revelation and other scholars I've looked at and I've put in my book, um, 
look at A. After Messiah was cut off, this was a view, Second Temple Judaism, there would be a transitionary reign or period of 40 years from their this age, which they understood as the Old Covenant age, to the age to come, or the New Covenant Messianic age, as an antitype to the first Exodus period. So they saw a transitionary reign of Messiah of 40 years as an antitype to the wilderness wandering. And it would be after Messiah was cut off. Interesting. Some believed in a literal thousand years, this is true, um, while others saw the thousand years, the Jews looked at the thousand years millennial reign, and they said, that's symbolic. So we have Jewish views during the New Testament times that looked at the thousand years out of Psalm 90 and some other texts as figurative. And they looked at Psalm 90 verse 4, and they took the thousand years there figuratively, Later on in Psalm 90, at verse 15, when they say, in the context of the wilderness wandering, make us glad according to the days that we've been afflicted. They took that and they said, we were, we've been afflicted 40 years in the wilderness. Lord, when you come, give us joy for 40 years. So they took a literal 40-year millennial transitional period of, of Messiah's reign. All right? So the thousand is symbolic, but they understood the 40 years to be the literal time frame. Uh, according to Daniel 24 through 27, the 70 weeks, the 77's prophecy, and other Old Testament texts, Second Temple Judaism and rabbis in general, some of them, believed that they calculated 10 jubilee periods, which are 49 years or 50 years. And they, they said, you know, t 10 of these comes to 490 years. And so from the destruction of the first temple to the coming of Messiah, there has to be 10 jubilees. All right. And Jesus shows up, if you do the, the math, he comes out at a jubilee period right around AD 26, AD 27, 28. And that's when he opens the scroll in Luke 4 of the jubilee of Isaiah 61. He says... I'm the fulfillment of the Jubilee. And later on in that chapter, it talks about the day of vengeance. Um, but they believed in, uh, was it 11Q Melchizedek? This is what they believed. What happened? Had to happen within 50 years of Messiah coming at this 10th Jubilee. Had to happen during that time frame. Messiah had to accomplish atonement, A, he had to gather his people to himself. That's the eschatological gathering in Matthew 24, 31. He had to judge the wicked. And here's, look at D. He had to judge Satan and the fallen watchers. In that generation. If he didn't, he wasn't Messiah. Doesn't that fit with the Olivet Discourse? Doesn't that fit with the book of Revelation? Look at E. They believed the end of the age war of Gog and Magog would be between Rome and apostate Jerusalem. They were outside of Jerusalem. They looked at the Pharisees and they said, those guys are apostate. The, the battle of Gog and Magog is soon going to take place. And it's going to be between those groups. And God's going to deliver us, the children of light, from this war. Well... Newsflash, they weren't the children of light, the Christians were. And the Christians were delivered and preserved from that war, and the Essenes just about got completely wiped out. Lester L. Grabe, I hope I'm pronouncing his last name. He says, views on the resurrection. It is sometimes asserted that the resurrection of the physical body was the characteristic Jewish belief. We hear this all the time. This is not born out of the data. A variety of beliefs seem to be attested about the same time in Israelite history. One of these was the resurrection of the body, but there is little reason to think that it was earlier or more characteristic of Jewish thinking than the immortality of the soul, and here's the key one, or resurrection of the spirit. And he summarizes from these uh, Second Temple uh, Jewish literature, Jubilees. Only the resurrection of the spirit is in view. First Enoch, after death, souls are gathered 
into an intermediate state where they experience some degree of consciousness, blessing, and punishment, where they await a final judgment. Okay, I mean, I remember Jeff was giving parallels between Enoch and the New Testament. I tend to lean in the direction that Luke 16 is kind of drawing from some of that. Um, that's just my personal opinion. C. <laughs> C. Testament of Abraham. Souls do not await a final judgment, but are rather judged immediately at death. Pretty close. Post AD 70, I would go with that. It's a point for man to die once and then the judgment. D. Uh, second Brock. Uh, souls. Baruch? How do you say that? Baruch? Soul, and now this is the key one right here, okay? Pay attention to D. Souls are in a conscience immediate, uh, intermediate state awaiting a predestined, they're the appointed time, at which time the righteous are rewarded with joy and the wicked are tormented. So they're conscious in an intermediate state, Abraham's bosom, Hades, and they're awaiting a resurrection, which is their souls would be raised out of that place into God's presence. Now that's my view. That's a lot of full preterists take that position. And I believe that is the position uh, John is taking in the book of Revelation as well. The coming of Messiah upon the clouds. According to Daniel 7, 13 and Malachi 3 and 4, the great notable day of the Lord when he would come and burn the temple. Did you know that there are Jews that look at those texts and say, that's Messiah. Not only that, because he's coming on the clouds, he's some kind of divine being. He may be God in some way. We don't know. All right. So these quote unquote Jews, they tell you the New Testament, that's just a made up religion. That has got nothing to do with Judaism and, and our traditions. Baloney. Absolute baloney. The New Testament is about as Jewish as it gets. Um, he would be divine and he would come upon the clouds and he would judge the temple. Um, so, you know, and, and let me go back here. Christians debate over Malachi 3 and 4. Is that the second coming? Yeah, it's the great notable day of the Lord. But it was fulfilled in AD 70 according to John the Baptist. It's both. It's both. It's both. Messiah would begin his earthly ministry at the beginning of the 10th Jubilee, which I already discussed. And he had to accomplish all those things in that time frame. Two, after Messiah would be put to death, you have that 40-year probation period. Messiah had to come upon the clouds in judgment to accomplish all of those things, including the war of Gog and Magog. They were expecting that in Second Temple Judaism. Now, did all of them believe that? No. How many of them believe that? I don't know. Probably a small percentage. Maybe even, but look, look at today. We, there's a small percentage here that believe exactly the time frame that John gives the millennial period. Since Messiah would come accomplishing this by the end of the age, um, again, the millennium would have to take place at that time and the resurrection of the souls would have to take place at the end of the end of the age according to Judaism but they identified that as the end of the old covenant age not the new covenant age which Paul of course says has no end now solving the problems of second temple Judaism <laughs> and harmonizing them with John's eschatology and Revelation 20 now let's do that with the Christian church the reformed church there's Ken Gentry, um, you know, he's a partial preterist, post-millennialist, and an ardent critic of our position. He loves to try and get everyone excommunicated. Oh, great guy. Um, then there's Keith Matheson. Um, let me back up. Gentry now holds that the resurrection of Daniel 12 was fulfilled spiritually in 87. We're going to be discussing that. Um, Keith Matheson believes that the coming of Christ now in Matthew 25 25, not 24, 25 was fulfilled in AD 70. Yeah, that's nothing to see there. Um, Doug Wilson, also a contributor t attacking us, believes the 2 Peter 3, the passing away of the heavens and earth, that was the old covenant world. It has nothing to do with the planet. But that, in Revelation 20, is when the earth and the sky flee away, right? 
It's, it's the same thing. If, if those two are parallel, 2 Peter 3 and the end of the millennium decreation, then the end of the millennium had to have occurred in 80, by AD 70. Uh, Gary DeMar, of course, you know, uh, partial preterist. Again, the coming of Christ in Matthew 25, AD 70. Um, the resurrection in Daniel 12, AD 70. Joel McDermott, his sidekick. The parable of the wheat and the tares took place at the end of the Old Covenant age, not the end of world history. But that's the resurrection of Daniel 12. Nothing to see here. Just keep walking by. Just keep walking by. Postmillennial partial preterist James B. Jordan, in his commentary, he was the first in print to steal our position and not tell you that it was our position. He tells you that the resurrection of Daniel 12 and Revelation 20, when Christ came in AD 70, he raised Abraham, not Abraham, he raised, well, I guess he could have raised Abraham's soul too. He raised Daniel's soul out of Abraham's bosom to inherit God's presence and eternal life. That's our view. And he says, AD 30 to AD 70 was kind of a millennium, but we're still in a kind of another millennium. Why does he do that? Because he doesn't want to get the rod from Mother Church. That's a quote from him. He doesn't want to be a full preterist because he would get the rod from Mother Church. The traditions of men. Don't fear men. Fear God alone. Postmillennial partial preterist Mike Bull. Interesting, he's a postmillennialist, but he believes every reference to the second coming in the New Testament was fulfilled in 1870. He follows, yeah, he follows Milton Terry and he follows James Stuart Russell, that there was only one second coming, coming it happened in 87. So, Mike, what ends the millennium? I mean, we, we get in these discussions all the time on Facebook. Uh, well, I said, if the second coming doesn't end the millennium that you say we're in, what does? Well, there'll be another judgment. What judgment is that in resurrection? Uh, Daniel 12. Well, it's only one. I don't see two there. Well, you know, so anyway. Partial preterist Peter Lightheart. Again, take 2 Peter 3 as AD 70, which is the fleeing away of, of the de and the decreation of the end of the millennium in Revelation 20. Newcomers to the partial preterist postmillennial view. James White, great debater, and his side, new sidekick, Jeff Durbin. We'll see. Uh, what they end up contributing. Of course, the most famous is um, R.C. Sproul. And we will be talking about the crisis in eschatology. All millennialists, um, Robert B. Strimple, Simon Kistemacher, G.K. Beale, uh, Sam Waldron. These are all guys that I've challenged to a debate or somehow are, are in one of my books or articles. Um, and that other book there, Who's that good-looking guy? Oh, okay. Um, that book was born out of you folks asking me to come and speak. Remember when I spoke on Islamic eschatology, um, uh, Talmudic Zionism and its eschatology, and uh, modern-day evangelical Zionism, and I went over sacred space, um, the end-time war, and how they all view that and are trying to self-fulfill it. But in that book, I go over Revelation 20 in much more detail. You can go to my website. I have an unedited version PDF file. You can check that out, and it's being edited right now as we speak. Um, what is the postmillennial partial preterist view? They believe that the thousand years is, is a symbolic period, but it's a long time. Okay? They also believe that during this time, the nations are going to be Christianized, and the remnants of the, peop the heretics and the unbelievers in those nations they're, either, they're going to get three opportunities to repent. So if you're a Reformed Baptist and you don't believe their version of uh, pedo-baptism, uh, you're in trouble. But you will be either stoned or shot in the head. All right? Lovely, lovely view of the kingdom there. Um, what is the classic amillennial view? Same thing. It's, it's the church age. It's the period of the last days. It's this already not yet. But here's the key. Key to this position, it concedes, and Bob went over this, the primary point of the thousand years is not, get that, is not a figurative reference to a long time, but is rather depicting completeness and fullness. That's our view. All right? He just gave away the farm away. And he goes on and he says in his, 
He's, he's looking at Second Temple Judaism and he admits some Jews believed in a 40-year millennial period between the two ages. That's our view. What are the differences? Well, they fight over uh, is it going to be an optimistic or a pessimistic period? Are the nations of the world going to be uh, saved or is it going to be characterized with apostasy and evil? What do they agree with when they criticize premillennialists? Well, they both would say, if a literal thousand-year millennial reign of Christ is such a critical and important aspect to your system and the Bible in general, then why is only seven verses dedicated to it in the entire Bible? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense at all. I would even add that Gentry... Um, why isn't a golden age mentioned in there? It's not. You have to imply it. So I want you to wrap your head around the hypocrisy here. All right. Gentry is saying premillennialism is heretical. It's not consistent with the creeds. Why? Because it has two resurrections. It has a physical resurrection before the thousand years and it has a physical resurrection at the end. That's not true. The resurrection takes place of the dead, uh, of the righteous and, and the wicked at the end of the age. So he says, it's awkward because they have two separate resurrections when the resurrection of all people are supposed to be simultaneously taking place at once. So, okay, agree. And he even says Daniel 12, 2 teaches this. Teaches only one resurrection. Look at that. He says in that book on the greatness of the Great Commission, Daniel 12, 2 is one resurrection. So that's why he's criticizing premillennialism for having two resurrections. What does he believe now? And he cites the creed, rebuking them. He shall come in glory to judge the quick and the dead. But yet Gentry believes there are two comings of Christ in glory to usher in a judgment of the quick and the dead. There's two comings that do this. And there are two judgments, um, and there are two passings away of the first heaven and the first earth. That doesn't make any sense. If the premillennial view is awkward, what in the world is this? And as of 2007, Jordan, and 2009, Gentry, they now believe that the resurrection of Daniel 12 was fulfilled spiritually in AD 70. But Gentry has to cherry pick it again. He says, to fit in with the creeds, he says, well, there was some kind of spiritual resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous in AD 70, but there will be another one in the future. It'll be a physical one. But he takes the tribulation, which is, takes place during the same three and a half years period, according to verse 7. He says, you can't double fulfill the tribulation, but you can double fulfill the resurrection. Ooh, consistency, thou rare jewel. Will a real orthodox gentry please stand up? All right, this is kind of my point there. What are the texts, theological constructs, and doctrines which bring the thousand-year millennial period to an end in both of these systems? Uh, the thousand-year period continues throughout the last days period. Do you see a problem with that? Remember, the thousand years is a symbolic period of the last days between Christ's first coming and his second coming. It's the last days. Well, let's go ahead and take away this already, not yet. Uh, Gary DeMar says the last days are not way off in the distant future. The end came to an end obsolete covenant in the first century. In A.D. 70, the last days ended. David Chilton, before he converted to our view, taught the same thing. So argument, if it's true that the thousand years is the period between the last days, but the last days ended in A.D. 70, conclusion, the millennium ended by A.D. 70 when the last day is pretty basic. What are the, te again, uh, number two, the thousand years millennial period is the already not yet time frame between this age um, ending before the age to come, all right, or the parable of the growth and the parable of the wheat and the tares, all right? So they're looking at, they're criticizing the, the premillennialists. Hey, man, the millennium is not just seven verses in an isolated chapter. This is already a not yet period, and it's describing the growth uh, right before the end of the age when the judgment and resurrection of Daniel 12 takes place. See any problem with that? In the, New Testament, in the New Testament, this age is the Old Covenant age, and the age to come is the New Covenant age. And it is conceded by Joel McDermott that this is true, and that the parable of the wheat and tares ended 
at the end of the Old Covenant age. It's not a judgment at the end of world history, but a judgment in AD 70. Uh, I'll go on here. He says, during this time, the angels would gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. And these would be judged with fire. Many of them literally were burned in the fire during the destruction of Jerusalem. During this same time, however, the elect of Christ, the children of the kingdom, will be harvested. While the explanation of the parable does not tell their final end. Yeah, it does. It talks about burning and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> the parable itself has the householder instructing the harvesters to gather the wheat into my, into my barn. In other words, they are protected and saved by God. This, of course, is exactly what happened to the Christians. Not only were they saved in soul, that's interesting, I'd like to pick his brain a little bit more on that, but they mostly fled Jerusalem before the Roman siege. This was consequent to Jesus' advice to flee and not look back uh, once the signs arose. Indeed, this would correspond with the angels' work of harvesting the elect. So the great harvest uh, of Matthew 24, 30, which takes place at the end of the Old Covenant age, and Matthew 13 was fulfilled in AD 70, not at the end of world history. So if Matthew 13 is this already not yet period before the millennium ends, and it was between AD 30 to AD 70 at the end of the Old Covenant age, then, of course, the millennium ended by that time as well. He goes on. He doesn't just do this in that parable. He goes on and he goes through uh, Paul's theology, and he says Paul used the same two-age model. This age was the Old Covenant age. The age to come was the New Covenant age. You give the farm away, folks. Once you concede that, it, the debate is, is over. Gary DeMar defines the end of the age in Matthew 24 as, this is interesting, the end of the Old Covenant and the consummation of the New Covenant. Now, he took that consummation part, I believe, out of some of his other editions. But that's interesting. I would agree. I, I believe the New Covenant came to its maturity. It was glorified. It was matured. And it continues today in that glorified, matured form. Unfortunately, both of these guys don't go to Second Temple Judaism, and they could find all kinds, all kinds of support for this, this age and age to come, being the Old Covenant age and the New Covenant age, and not this age being our age now and the age to come being, you know, uh, when, when literal wolves are, are not eating li literal lambs, which is not the point of that passage. Um, there are statements to the effect that a period of 40 years would elapse between the death of the teacher, Messiah, and the end of the age. And then, of course, Dr. Cohen says the same thing. We've already gone over this, that the, that the Messiah would reign between those ages for 40 years. And, of course, the argument there, um, the already not yet period between this age and the age to come is conceded to be 40 years. Therefore, the millennium ended before AD 70. The millennial thousand-year reign of Christ will come to an end after a long time. Remember in Matthew 24 and 25 of the parables, you know, uh, of the servant, he beats the other servant, he says the, the master of the house went on a journey for a long time, and when he comes back, you know, what's going to happen? And Ken Gentry says, this is the period of the millennium of Revelation 20. It's this long time in Matthew 24 and 25. Oh... Is there a problem with this? His own sidekick, Gary DeMar, gives the farm away again. The long time and delay of Matthew 24 and 25 is uh, not an already not yet of a thousand years, but rather 40 years. I'm sorry. This is Gary's quote. Notice that the evil slave says, my master is not coming for a long time. The evil slave then proceeds to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards. But to the surprise of the evil slave, the master returned when he least expected him. The master did not return to cut the evil slave's distant relatives, <laughs> relatives in pieces. He cut him in pieces. The evil slave was alive when the master left, and he was alive when the master returned. In this context, a long time must be measured against a person's lifetime. In context, 
Two years could be a long time if the master usually returned within six months. The same idea is expressed in the parable of the talents. Again, the idea, and then he goes down and he lists everywhere in the New Testament where long time is referred, and it's always within the lifetime of a person. All right? So much for the already and not yet of this text being the millennium. If Gary is right, and he is, then the already and not yet is between this age and the age to come, 40 years, and that is when the millennium ended. And he goes on, I like this, <clears throat> that second paragraph. This, this brief analysis helps us understand the mockers in 2 Peter who ask, where is the promise of his coming? Peter was aware that Jesus' coming was an event that would take place before the last apostle died. The doctrine of the soon return of Christ was common knowledge, it is not hard to imagine that the passage of, a passage of several decades would lead someone to doubt the reliability of, reliability of the prophecy, especially as that generation was coming to a close. So that's, that's a good insight there on 2 Peter 3 as well. But what about the amillennialist and uh, gentry's passage of Christ coming in glory and judgment? See... Gentry runs to, and G.K. Beale does too, Beale has finally kind of said, well, maybe Matthew 24, 30 is A.D. 70. He used to say, well, that's just the one second coming event. But then Beale goes to Matthew 25. They always go to Matthew 25, 31. But this is for sure the second coming of Jesus, right? But Gary DeMar and Keith A. Matheson, who's in charge of Ligonier Ministries, says that the coming of Christ, even in Matthew 24, or 25, 31, is 80, 70. That is a huge problem because that is the coming that produces the judgment of the devil and the angels and the wicked, right? That is the amillennial view, and we agree with that. So here's the argument. If it's true that Christ's coming in glory after a long time and seeing delay found in Matthew 24 and 25 is the period of the thousand years, if that's true, and I believe it's true, I'm reformed, I believe that's true, minor premise. But if it's also true that this was a period of 40 years, I'm orthodox, I'm reformed, I, I agree with that too. Then the conclusion is the long time of the millennium ended by AD 70. There's no way out of that. And I'd like to see someone try. Number four, the one imminent second coming of Christ dedicated as bookends. We've already covered this. Um, the Westminster Confession of Faith, your classic amillennialist, everywhere in the book of Revelation where the, the coming of the Lord is mentioned, they admit this is the second coming of Christ. But then you have partial preterists that say, this is not the second coming of Christ. Can you, I want you to imagine the absurdity of this view. Think about it. And, and Keith Matheson buries this in a note. The coming of Christ in the Olivet Discourse, which is the cornerstone of all New Testament eschatology, the coming of Christ mentioned there is not the second coming. The book of Revelation, where everyone thinks that is the second coming event, clearly, that's not the second coming either. Keith Matheson, after partial preterists have surrendered all of these passages of the second coming, he says, you know, there was a gradual revealing of Revelation. Jesus just didn't talk about his second coming. It was revealed to Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. That is just a really bizarre... Instead of just harmonizing Jesus' eschatology with Paul's, that's what you have to come up with. It's really bizarre. Here's the argument. I need to save time, but I think at this point you're kind of getting the, uh, the idea. So summary thus far, we have taken away an alleged future to us, thousand years, already and not yet period, of the following passages and or eschatological motifs using only reformed orthodox, supposedly consistent and straight, which we've seen are not that consistent and straight unless we enter the picture. Number one, the last days, well, that already not yet period was 40 years. Well, how about this age and the age to come? Well, no, that was a period of 40 years. That's the millennial period. The parable and the growth of the wheat and the tares, that's surely the period of the millennium. No, that ended in the Old Covenant age in AD 70, so the millennium ended. How about the long time in the Olivet? No, that's 40 years too. Um, well, what about the one imminent second coming in Revelation? That ends the millennium. 
Uh, no, that was fulfilled in AD 70. You can kind of see where this is all going, right? It's leading to us. Number five, the one coming of Christ in glory in Matthew 24 and 25 is equal to 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 to judge and raise the quick and the dead. And this coming of Christ ends the millennium of Revelation 20. We've got you now, Mike. We, we may have a problem with the coming of Christ in the book of Revelation. Some of us say it's the second coming. Some of us say it was in 8070. But we're going to run outside of Revelation and we're going to find a coming that ends the millennium of Revelation 20, and we're going to agree on that, and that will bury your butt right there. Right? Problem. But as we have seen, it has been conceded that the coming of Christ in Matthew 24 and 25 was fulfilled in AD 70. I have my Reformation Ligonier Study Bible here. If you go to Matthew 24, 30 and 31, it will tell you in the footnote, because of the parallels between Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, the coming of Christ in Matthew 24 is the one and second coming event. I'm not coming up with this chart. It's a good chart. All millennials love this chart. They, they might want to use the chart. Um, G.K. Bill, Bill has a very similar chart in his commentary on 1 Thessalonians 4 that I used because I, I didn't want to use my own source. I wanted to use their source. But you can clearly see that if Matthew 24 is equal to 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, which it is, I believe that, just like an all millennials believes that, but Matthew 24 was fulfilled in AD 70 and they're the same thing, then that means 1 Thessalonians 4 was fulfilled in AD 70. It's just basic logic, and it's more importantly the analogy of faith, which is Scripture interprets Scripture, and Scripture cannot contradict Scripture. And if B, everyone agrees that first the, the coming of Christ in Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15 is the same, then they're all parallel. Look at all this. It's beautiful. The harmony of Scripture is wonderful. The coming of Christ in the Olive Discourse is the second coming, Jesus said it would take place in his generation. Paul concedes that point in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15 when he says, we will. John MacArthur says in those passages, Paul believed the second coming was going to take place in his contemporary generation. Go figure, Go figure that. <laughs> my, my former pastor and college president said that. And there are other Reformed commentators that will agree. Problem. Jesus says, I'm going to give you the Spirit and he's going to lead you into soteriology and views on the Trinity and views on justification. He's going to lead you concerning things to come. The Holy Spirit is specifically going to be given to you to remember my teachings, but specifically eschatology. Paul's not giving you his opinion. Peter isn't giving you his opinion when he says the end of all things is at hand. John's not giving you his opinion when he says it is the last hour, and Paul is not giving you his opinion that he thought Christ was going to come in the lifetime of those around him because Jesus said that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom in great glory. So we have a problem there. If all of these are equal, and yet Matthew 24 and 25 the coming of Christ in those passages were AD 70. You can't get around this. If you can get around this, let's have a debate. Let's not even have a debate. Let's have a symposium. Let's have a discussion together. Don't try and excommunicate us. Don't try to bar us from books like Three Views on the Millennium. Let's discuss these things. Again, they're all the same event. Beautiful harmony. That's what I love about preterism. It's just scripture interprets itself, glorifies Christ. And uh, of course, here's the actual argument. If they're the same, if they're all the same, which the all millennial says they are, but Matthew 24 and 25, the coming of Christ was fulfilled in 8070, and those comings in the millennium, then the millennium ended when Christ came in glory to judge the quick and the dead. He doesn't come twice to judge the quick and the dead. He comes one time at the end of the age. 
Six, the one second coming of Christ in Matthew 24 and 25 uh, it talks about a throne judgment of Christ. The quick and the dead are judged. The devil and the angels are judged. And the decreation um, takes place. These are all the same things in Revelation 20. Look at them. If, again, if you're going to say the coming of Christ in Matthew 24 and 25 was by AD 70, then you have to concede and that that coming ends the millennium of Revelation 20. They're the same event. Look at the harmony. Yeah, I mean, you can't, you have to just totally walk by this, but it's beautiful. Uh, there's the argument. I'm going to save some time, go over, go past it. My seventh point, the analogy of faith and parallels concerning the resurrection and judgment of Daniel 12 is the end of the millennium of Revelation 20. All right? But again, Revelation, or Daniel 12 says that the resurrection and judgment is going to come at a time of the end. It doesn't say the time of the ends. It says the time of the end. Verse 7, what is the time of the end? Well, Daniel, it's a period of three and a half years when the power of the holy people is completely shattered. Mr. Gentry, how in the world do you have two three and a half year periods, two ends of the ages, and two different resurrections spanning thousands and possibly millions of years? How do you read that into that passage? I, it's pure eisegesis to toll the creedal line. The resurrection and judgment of Daniel 12 is clearly the end of the millennium judgment and resurrection of Revelation 20. Look at those parallels. Only those whose names are written in the book would be delivered or saved from eternal condemnation. The same thing is mentioned in Revelation. In fact, John is drawing from and basically quoting Daniel 12. This is the time for the resurrection, the judgment, same thing. Now, the old Greek Septuagint says it's the hour of the end. I'm going to get that in a second. Um, Revelation says this hour is a short time when Satan makes war with, the, with Christ and the saints. So again, major premise, if the, if the judgment and resurrection of Daniel 12 is the end of the millennium, and it's the same uh, prophecy in Revelation 20, but Gentry and Jordan and these others have to concede that it was spiritually fulfilled in AD 70, then the end of the millennium had to have taken place in AD 70. Unless you just want to start reading two things of everything in passages that only mention one. Eighth, the already not yet hour is coming and now is, I really like this, judgment of John 5 is the, is the resurrection of Daniel 12 and the end of the millennium, judgment and resurrection of Revelation 20. And this is pretty standard uh, reformed. When you go to John 5, uh, the first part is dealing with regeneration. You know, you're going to hear the voice. You're going um, to believe. And he correlates this with Revelation 20. And I have no problem with this parallel. I think it's beautiful. I, I agree with him, right? Same author, whether it's Lazarus or John, it's the same author. That's the point. Truly I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes on him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. That's the already. You believe in Christ, you don't come into judgment, you have eternal life. Now I believe that already comes at Pentecost, uh, when the giving of the Holy Spirit is, and as Pastor Curtis says, it's the birth of the church. But uh, when the giving of the Spirit is, John 7, verses 37-39. Um, Truly I say to you, an hour is coming... That's the eschatological not yet, okay? And now is, that's the eschatological imminent already, when the dead will hear his voice um, and come out of their graves, all of them, all right? Now, Gentry will say, well, the first resurrection in Revelation 20 is that spiritual regeneration. We're, we're seated in heavenly places, right? Ephesians 2 says, we've been raised, right? That's the first resurrection. That's what John is dealing with early on in Revelation 20. I don't have a problem with that. I really don't. I think that's, that's probably correct. Um, where he errs is the second part of John 5 saying that that is dealing with the physical resurrection. It doesn't say anything about physical resurrection there. It says people will come out of the tombs, all of them, but Gentry just got done telling us 
when the resurrection of Daniel 12, when they come up out of the dust, oh, that's metaphorical. It, it, was, it was fulfilled in AD 70. So if people coming, being raised out of the dust is metaphorical, why do we have to demand that this is a physical resurrection? Because it talks about people coming out of tombs. Not only that, Mr. Gentry, you go to Ezekiel 37, and when Israel comes out of their graves, plural, it's a metaphorical resurrection. It's when they come out of bondage from Babylonian captivity back into their land. So coming out of the graves or coming out of the tombs is not proof of a physical resurrection at the end of world history, at the end of the thousand years. It's just not. Even more beautifully, uh, G.K. Beale gives the resurrection of Daniel 12 and already not yet. I don't have a problem with that. Let's just assume that's true. All right. Here's a chart that he produces. Uh, again, the old Greek, it says the hour of the end. And John is drawing, or Jesus is drawing on the hour. He, they're drawing from the resurrection of Daniel 12. That's the only resurrection that talks about eternal life. And it's the only resurrection that talks about a, a resurrection of the just and the unjust. So clearly, John is drawing on that. Look at this. This is beautiful. Think about this. You guys know what a chiasm is? Chiasm is A, B, B, A. A links to A, B. They did this so that they can memorize different things. John wants you to know that whatever, whatever coming hour was and that is, now is in John chapter 4 is the same coming hour and now is in John 5. It's a chiasm. Look, you can't get rid of these parallels. The hour is coming, that is the not yet, when ye shall, he's talking to the Samaritan woman at the well, you, you won't say on this mountain or, you know, we worship on this mountain or we worship in Jerusalem. Why? Jesus is looking to 87. Now, Gentry says this was the coming hour. That's that eschatological not yet. That was 8070 because that's when sacred space was removed. God destroyed Jerusalem. The old covenant was done. We don't worship in a physical place anymore. That's what Jesus is referring to. Oh, so the eschatological coming hour of John 4 is 8070. Got it. And the, and the hour is, is right now. So Jesus is telling the Samaritan woman, don't worry, don't pack your bags based upon what I said and move to Jerusalem because that, that's going to be destroyed relatively soon. But I want you to stay here. You see these people that are going to come? I want you to tell, you see they're coming around the corner? I want you to tell them about me. I'm the Messiah. I'm the temple. Out of me comes living waters. You know Ezekiel when he's talking about out from underneath the temple, the waters come? I'm that. And if you believe in me, living waters will flow through me, through you, to these people that are coming. I want you to stay here. All right? Tell them about me. So, the already and the not yet of the coming hour and now is of John 4, if you concede that's AD 70, I don't see any reason why you won't concede that John 5 is also fulfilled in AD 70, especially if it's the resurrection of Daniel 12, which you've already conceded was in AD 70. I just, I don't see how you get around that. Yeah, desperation, exactly. Creedal desperation. I don't want to lose my job, desperation. I don't want to have publishers cancel my, my, my contracts because I'm a heretic now. No, I, I don't want to stand for God's truth. Well, if we let Scripture interpret Scripture, if we let John or Lazarus Lazarus interpreted himself. He tells us when the hour of John 5, that not yet hour, is. My little, my little children, it is the last hour. Gentry says that was AD 70. Revelation 14, we want to know when this is, right? He says, uh, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. And he even connects that hour with the harvest. That is the end of the age, judgment and resurrection. John, within Revelation himself, within the book itself, is telling you that that hour of John 5 is imminent, and it would be the end of the millennium judgment and resurrection event. James Jordan takes the already not yet resurrection of Daniel 12. I'm gonna, I don't have much time, right? How, where am I, how am I doing on time? I got 10 minutes. Okay, good. Let's read some of these. These are great quotes. Now, <clears throat> this is our view of the resurrection, all right? It's just partial preterism has been challenged so much on Daniel 12. I mean, Pastor Curtis at a conference was just 
R.C. Sproul, great, you've come to partial predator, but what do you do with the resurrection of Daniel 12? Right? Dan Harden even had to write a, write a book on that. Uh, I remember, uh, oh, what's the guy? Hank Hanegraaff, yeah, the, the Bible answer man. I went down there to Charlotte, it was pouring rain. He's got this big studio and there's a big glass bet you know, between you and him. And you can sit in the studio, I was the only one there. I said, he, and he was live on the radio, not nationwide. Ask me any question. Do you believe the tribulation was fulfilled in 8070? Uh, in in uh, Daniel 12, he's told that the tribulation and the resurrection will take place during a three and a half years. You're one of the power of the Holy Spirit. What do you do with Daniel 12? Did that resurrection take place when the tribulation did or not? He's live on air. He's looking at the question. He looks at, the, he looks at me. <laughs> he looks at the question. He looks at me. He gives me this look. And he put it down. After the show, he didn't read the question on there. After he comes out and he says, uh, oh, so what's your name? I said, well, you know, my name's Mike, Calvary Chapel background. You have a Calvary Chapel background. You know, let's talk about this. You're preterist, I used to be a partial preterist. I had a hard time with this passage. I'm just, you know, I used to hold to your view. Well, the resurrection had to take place then, did it? He had his assistant, then his assistant comes to help him. And that conversation went on for an hour. I wish I could have recorded it. I answered every question. To the glory of God, him, giving me wisdom unto him, uh, you know, he is wisdom for us. I answered every question they, they, they asked of me. And I kept coming back to this question. They would not answer it. And I had like 10 other ones that they didn't answer. He said, Mike, I promise you, we're going to have discourse. Write me a letter. I, I, I want to answer this question. How many years ago? He didn't. He didn't. Touch that with a 10-foot pole. Anyway, getting back to the point. <clears throat> it's now conceded that, yeah, we have to answer this. The resurrection of Daniel 12 was in 8070. The resurrection of Daniel 12 seems to connect the evangelistic and teaching ministry spoken of in verse 3. Thus, it is some kind of historical resurrection that is spoken of, a resurrectional event in world history, not at the end of world history. Daniel 12, 2 tells us that in the days of, Je of Jesus, the nation will undergo a, a last, note that, notice that, a last spiritual resurrection. A resurrection of Israel is in view. So he's saying the resurrection is a already not yet. He's saying it's progressive. He's saying it's spiritual and it's a corporate resurrection. All right? That's a preterist view. That, that's my, one of my views of the, of the resurrection. He says, Revelation <clears throat> uh, takes up where Daniel leaves off and deals mostly with the apostolic age and the death and resurrection of the church. In other words, <clears throat> Old Covenant Israel is like a body. It's decaying, it's waxing old, and it's, it's going to die. The, the physical types and shadows of it, it's, that body is going to die. But it's going to be raised in a different form. It's going to be spiritual we have a spiritual circumcision. We have a spiritual baptism. We are the city of the living God. We are the new Jerusalem. And on and on. we are the temple. Right? All these spiritual things. Um, so that's what he's saying. But he doesn't stop there. He adopts our view again. He says, Daniel was promised after his death or rest in Abraham's bosom, he will stand up, that is, be raised with all God's saints and join Michael on a throne in heaven as described in Revelation 20. An event, interesting, he doesn't give the verses. An event that came after the Great Tribulation and in the year 8070. Abraham's, or I keep calling Daniel Abraham. Daniel's soul was raised out of Abraham's bosom into God's presence to inherit eternal life in 8070 at the soon coming of the Lord. That's our, our view. Is there anything in a footnote there that this is the full preterist view of the resurrection? No other, no other early church father was teaching this. No credit at all. That's, that's really bad scholarship, but even more, it's deceptive. And I believe it's sin. But I, I appreciate the honesty, though, because we'll use it. So there's my eighth argument. The resurrection of Daniel 12 involves souls coming out of Hades or Abraham's bosom. Um, 
it, it's only one judgment and resurrection. That's what the creedal view, that's the amillennial view, but it is now conceded it took place in AD 70. Yeah, well, if it's only one resurrection and one judgment event, but it happened in AD 70, then our view is correct. You cannot, see, only one of these can be true if you're a futurist. Either the major premise is true or the minor premise is true. And you can't deceive the Reformed community by saying, well, we, we're, we stand shoulder to shoulder in unity against those, those full preterists. Because if you're a futurist, only one of those can be true. And orthodoxy just means straight. That's what the word means. It means straight. It means straight talking one. In other words, you're consistent in what you believe. And the truth is consistent. That's what orthodoxy means. There's no orthodoxy there. That's a contradiction unless you adopt full preterism. There's one judgment and resurrection of Daniel 12, and it was fulfilled spiritually in AD 70. End of discussion. Last argument, and we're done. Uh, these are charts that I've done. I'm, gonna go th I'm not going to go through them. I'm just going to show you the correlation, all right? We've, I've already shown you how partial preterists surrender these key texts. The debate's over. If the coming of Christ in Matthew 25 was AD 70, that means the judgment of the devil was done at that time as well. If the end of the age in Matthew 13 happened, that means that the resurrection of Daniel 12 happened. I've already told you and shown you that they believe Daniel 12. Just look at all the harmony between these passages. This is for you people watching online, for you here later on. Stop it, write it down, study it, look at these, okay? Beautiful harmony. <clears throat> more I've got one more argument here okay if the resurrection of Daniel 12 had an already not yet progressive corporate bodily resurrection between 8030 to 8070 and if the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 and it's that resurrection then does the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 have an already not yet progressive corporate body resurrection of Israel and the church between 8030 to 87? If they're the same resurrection, which Reformed theologians admit they are, and, and uh, Jordan just told us it was a progressive spiritual corporate bodily resurrection that ends up with souls going out of Abraham's bosom into God's presence, which is our view, then is that possibly in 1 Corinthians 15? The Weiss New Testament translates 1 Corinthians 15, 26 as, as a last enemy, the death, that is the spiritual death that came through Adam the day he died, is being abolished for all things he put in subject, subjection under his feet. Death was in a process of being destroyed. If that's physical death, how's physical death been in the process of being destroyed for the last 2,000 years. Now, Weiss New Testament, uh, James White, your dad worked for Mr. Weist, and I don't know if that was in helping with Greek translation or what, but I would be curious what you think of that translation. It's a valid translation. I'm not making that up. It's definitely a valid translation. Commentators have struggled with that. I can definitely document that as well. But if that's a valid translation, then these are some other verses that could, I'm not saying are definite, but they could. It's a possibility. Death is being destroyed, but God is giving it a body. It is being, it is being raised in glory. It is being raised in power. It is being sown a natural body. It is being raised a spiritual body. So it's, pro it's possible. Again, if Daniel 12 has an already and not yet process resurrection, and we see that in John 5, and we see it in Revelation 20 with the first resurrection being regeneration, seated on the thrones, and then the not yet is coming out of Hades, then we have a process here in 1 Corinthians 15. Possibly. Just throw it out there. Well, Paul, tell us, what was your view of the millennium? I mean, if... The resurrection and judgment of Daniel 12 is the end of the millennium judgment in Revelation 20. Paul, when would that take place? Well, let me tell you. There is about to be a rising again of the dead, both of the righteous and unrighteous. Young's literal translation. 
having hope in God, which they themselves also await, that there is about to be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. The Berean little translation. We better get that, right? The Berean, that's a good one. Having hope toward God, which they themselves also wait for that there is about to be a resurrection of the both and the dead. Literal standard version. Interesting. If you want uh, a literal translation, these literal translations tell you mellow is about to be. Wymouth New Testament, same thing. Smith's literal translation, same thing. The interlinear literal translation of the Greek New Testament says mellow in this passage, or is, should be translated about to be. So, Paul clearly believed the end of the millennium, resurrection and judgment was about to take place. Argument nine. This is called, and then I'll finish with this, all right? Recapitulation. If you're an all-millennialist, you believe the judgment scene and resurrection that ends the millennium in Revelation 20, that's the same judgment that is, has been recapitulated in chapters 1 through 19 and also 21 and 22. It's the same scene. Okay? But the partial predator says all of these chapters have been fulfilled in AD 70. Look at all these events. There's past persecution, more persecution to come, and vindication of the martyrs motif in Revelation 6 and Revelation 12. Chapter 20 deals with the same thing. There's a future persecution uh, that lasts for a little while, and Satan has a little while longer in Revelation 6 and 12. We have the same motif of this little while of Satan being released, which is between AD 67 to 70 for the battle of Gog and Magog. Every mountain and island fled away. That Greek word fuego, it's used when the earth and, when the, earth and the heaven fled from God's presence. That is something that ends the millennium peri millennial period. Well, John elsewhere in the book of Revelation uses the same Greek word, and he says that this decreation is referring to AD 70, and partial preterists admit that. So my friend Michael Bennett asked Joel McDermott, he says, I I'm just curious, a great question. I'm just curious, Joel, why in Revelation 20, when the earth and the heaven flee, why is that the physical creation? And yet you take 2 Peter 3 is 80, 70. You take the passing of heaven and earth in Matthew 24, 35 is 80, 70. You guys take the passing of heaven and earth in Matthew 5. In other words, 99% of all the decreation passages you say are 80, 70. Why is this one verse in the entire New Testament supposed to be the end of the world, the physical planet? And he went on, he says, well, there are two different Greek words uh, for the passing of the first heaven and earth in Revelation 21 versus here. But he didn't tell you that fuego is used in um, Revelation 6. Obviously, he doesn't want to because you can't make an argument. Well, two different Greek words are used. If the same Greek word you say is referring to de the decreation of Israel in the same book. So here again, you have the judgment of the dead, the judgment of the dead, the last days. You know, everything in Revelation 20 that ends the millennium is already in the book of Revelation uh, fulfilled soon. So it's, it's just bizarre that you would just plant everything in these few verses and say that they're future. So if it's true that the end of the millennium events and consummation judgment scenes in Revelation 20 are recapitulated in all the other chapters, but all the other chapters were fulfilled in 8070. Well, then Revelation 20 was fulfilled in 8070. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. I drive a truck for a living, guys. It's just, it's just common sense. It's just common sense. All right. Questions. Well, let's, let's conclude with just what we've seen. Um, Jesus is a perfect Messiah. He, he, uh, he fulfilled everything that was required of him in, for, in Second Temple Judaism. He came during the 10th Jubilee. He opened up the scroll at the 10th Jubilee and, and said, I, I, am, I am the Jubilee of Isaiah 61. He judged Satan when, he said, Paul says that Satan would be crushed under the Romans' feet shortly. Um, all these things in the millennium, if you'd let Scripture interpret itself. And we've harmonized Reformed eschatology as well. So that was my goal. I hope Christ is more beautiful to you today than he was 
a few moments ago as you see the harmony of Scripture. Uh, if you have any questions online, that's, that's cool. Fire away. If not, if you guys have any questions. In Ezekiel, when, when there's that picture of the sh stream that comes out of the temple, yes. that it starts with a temple, and then it becomes a stream, yes. and then it becomes a river that can't be forded. And, but there's still marshy areas in it. Um, how do you see that? I mean, is that something that we would we were think in terms of? Because I think Demar grasps onto that, and that's a big thing that's kind of holding off, uh, you know, the final consummation of all things. I think he's thinking, well, there's more marsh than there is fresh water right now, and I think he sees it that way. How do you see that with Ezekiel? How do you see that playing out? Is it like, like a numbers thing, or it's just sort of a, a you know, it's like it's not something that's going to literally happen like that. You know where I'm looking for numbers. Where I'm okay. All right. There's more Christians than there are non-Christians. Yeah, I can see that. How do you see that playing out? It's definitely a progression, and I think a thousand is actually mentioned in there too. Um, but I just see it as as metaphor, and you can't press metaphors yeah. just too strictly. I mean, if you press metaphors too strictly, you'd have contradiction. You know, the the church is the bride of Christ, but the church is also the children of the bride. You know, I mean. Um, so I, that's kind of how I'd answer that. It's, just, it's a metaphor. The point is, is that Jesus is that temple yeah. where, the, where eternal life comes from. And um, I would answer that by it's the second coming of Christ, the imminent second coming revelation that ends the millennium. And then you have those 21 and 22 that are now going to tell you what it's like, life in the new creation. And um, there's evangelism taking place. So the river's still flowing. Uh, the river didn't stop flowing in 87. It's yeah, just, yeah. It's just um, in the age to come, the gates of the city are open. The access to the living water is there. Christ is the tree of life. Um, the gates being open communicate two things, um, that sinners come through the gates through faith in Christ, and that the gates are always open in ancient times meant you were secure because they always closed the gates because they were fearful of people coming in. The gates are, there's nothing to fear because... Um, Christ has conquered death. He's, he's conquered the devil. Um, and he's conquered the law. So that's, I guess, my take on that. I, I got a question, Mike. Uh, someone uh, texted in and says, late date of revelation supposedly refutes preterism. How do you argue the point? Yeah, key word, supposedly. Yeah. Supposedly. <laughs> um, <laughs> my wife was just getting on me. Uh, yeah, read Gentry's book. Um, before Jerusalem fell, uh, if you want to study that. There's just way too much internal evidence in the book of Revelation that, that supports that it was written before AD 70. Well, we can get into Nero, we can get into the beast, um, but that's just something you'll have to uh, read Gentry's book, Before Jerusalem Fell, The Beast of Revelation. Um, and most importantly, let scripture interpret itself. Every theologian I know, every commentator I know says that John's version of the Olivet Discourse is the book of Revelation. If it's the same, same event, Jesus says he would come in that generation, why would we think Revelation is something post-8070, or written post-8070? Another question, uh, what happens to believers and unbelievers when they die in the current age? I believe, you know, I think Hebrews is a good, you know, it is the point for man to die once and then the judgment. There was that Jewish view that when you died, you immediately went, your soul immediately went into God's presence and you were judged. Um, I like that view. It's just, it's post AD 70. Uh, there is no waiting place. There's no Abraham's bosom anymore. Hades has been emptied. So you go directly. And, you know, do you get a glorified body at this point? And here's my take on the resurrection and how I synthesize or harmonize this whole corporate body, immortal body at death view. All right? And this, and this differs a little bit from Pastor Curtis and the Annihilation view, but it's just my personal opinion. Um, I believe that there's a corporate resurrection taking place in 1 Corinthians 15 and a corporate body resurrection in 2 Corinthians 5. Okay? But why do I believe that? This is important. In the Old Testament, when a person died, I believe that they went to Abraham's bosom. They were conscious, just like Luke 16 mentions. 
and that they had some bodily existence. Why do I say that? When Samuel was called up, when Saul wanted to call up Samuel, he said, T tell me what he looks like. That's Samuel. His soul or spirit had a bodily form, just like his physical body, but it wasn't his physical body. So here's my point is I think that Paul is using this kind of just common understanding that when a person dies, they have a spiritual body. And he's saying, just like Israel is a corporate body that is waxing old, it's entered its last days, it's dying, and it's going to yield to a spiritual body, the New Covenant Church body. So that's kind of how I, I see them. In post AD 70, you have that same spiritual body you had in the Old Testament when you died. It's just you either go to the lake of fire or you go into God's presence. There's no physical resurrection body at all. Another question says, uh, is this information that was presented here in one of your books, if so, which one? This was awesome. <laughs> oh, cool, thanks. Um, yes, it was, uh, you guys granted me uh, the opportunity to speak at one of the conferences in that new book, Armageddon Deception, that Jeff is helping me with on the cover, the back cover, which you still own. Um, it's all in there. All the rabbinical sources. And that book's not out yet, though, right? No, but it's on a PDF file. You can go to my website. It's, it's right, fullpreterism.com. I have a, an entire chapter in there on how do you witness to a, a Muslim? Mm -hmm. How do you witness to a Jew today? Mm -hmm. I show you all these. I debated Michael Brown, and he is the world's form. I mean, he, he claims he's a Christian Jew, and he debates rabbis all the time and tries mm -hmm. to prove that Jesus is the Messiah to them. Mm -hmm. And um, I think full preterism actually proves that Jesus is or Yeshua is Messiah more than any view. And I've I've got a lot of rabbinical quotes. Uh, I got a lot of source material in there to sh to to show the Jew, quote unquote, that uh, Yeshua is Messiah. And the millennial stuff's all in there too. Okay, I got one more. This is a yes or no question. <laughs> oh, a trick question. Yeah. Okay. What about the return of Christ for the bride? Was that AD 70? Yes, we see the bride. Uh, Jesus' eschatology on the wedding motif is in Matthew 24. He says he's going to come in that generation, and he says that that's, you know, he gives the parable of the ten virgins. Um, in 1 Thessalonians 4, when Paul says that the rapture, he says, we're going to meet the Lord. That Greek word for meet is only used one other time, and that's in the parable of the wedding in, in the Olivet Discourse. So um, the wedding took place in AD 70 when the divorce of the first old covenant wife. In Revelation, it's a tale of two cities. It's a tale of two white women. It's a tale of two wives. All right? He was going to divorce Old Covenant Jerusalem, and he was going to marry New Covenant Jerusalem. Two brides. The divorce takes place at the same time as the marriage. So, yes. Cool. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Let's pray real quick. God, thank you again for the opportunity to be here and to present your word. I pray, Lord, that this will just go as far as you want to take it. I pray, Lord, that there were people watching online that just maybe don't tune in or just at, through your providence stumbled across this. And they've been st studying partial preterism and seeing the inconsistencies and, and, and trying to struggle with their amillennialism as well. And Lord, I hope that this helped them. I hope, Lord, that you will give them strength and courage um, to say, you know what? Let God be true and every man a liar if that's what it takes. I'm going to cast my lot with this small remnant of people that love you, that love your sovereign and free grace and the fact that your kingdom is here and it is within us. Lord, just cause these people to rejoice in your truth in the harmony of your scripture. And Lord, may there be a great reformation that takes place in the Reformed community and the sovereign grace community and even in evangelicalism, Lord, that this truth can just go as far and wide as you want it to go. And please use this small, humble church, Lord, uh, in whatever way you want. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.